Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on our AHA team training monthly webinar. My name is Jen Braun and I'm the director of the AHA team training program. Um, welcome to our August webinar on creating age-friendly health systems. So before we get just a few rules of the road, um, audio can be accessed in two ways, uh, either through your computer or through your phone. Um, so if you need to switch to audio, you should be able to click the little up arrow uh, next to your microphone and switch to phone or switch to computer if needed. Uh, but please know everyone is in a listen only mode. Uh, we highly encourage questions to be submitted throughout the presentation in the chat pod. Uh, if you have a question that's more technical or logistical in nature, we'll answer right away. But if it's a question for our speakers, we will save it for the end and do a moderated Q&A. Uh, just a few other notes that this webinar is being recorded. So if you have to uh, step out or if you want to share with a colleague after, uh, the webinar will be recorded and posted on our website and we'll notify all registrants when it has been posted. Um, and one item of note for the chat, uh, just to call out that you can either chat hosts and panelists or chat everyone on this webinar. So please keep that in mind if you send a chat. Uh, we're very happy and pleased to offer continuing education credit. Uh, so this is one hour of CE credit. If you are new to us, uh, you'll have to create a Duke OneLink account. Duke is our CE provider um, and it's a one-time only setup it's to create an account. If you've already done so, you're good to go. And what you're gonna do is after this webinar today, you're gonna to chat in the code you see there, V-A-N-F-E-P to the uh, phone number you see there. Uh, and you have 24 hours to do so. We will chat this in numerous times. Do not worry, we'll also share it at the end. Um, so that is something you'll need to do to claim um, your CE credit. Uh, we're really excited to have a bunch of upcoming AHA team training events for the remainder of the year. Uh, we have our team steps in person master training courses. Um, our September and October courses are full, if not mostly full. Uh, so we still have availability uh, at no on November 9th and 10th at Houston Methodist or December 6th and 7th at Tulane. Uh, my colleague Rachel is chatting in some of those direct links there for you to learn more. Uh, if in-person is uh, uh, not your thing, we also have virtual options. So we have a really exciting uh, workshop series called Managing Conflict in Healthcare that starts next month. Uh, and in, in addition to that, we have, uh, I believe, seven week long uh, Team Steps course for change leaders and champions. This is a really unique course in that if you need a refresher or want more information on Team Steps implementation, this is the course for you. Uh, and it begins in October and there are seats available there. Additionally, we are happy and pleased to continue offering you uh, these complimentary webinars. We have another one next month uh, regarding emotional support for healthcare team members and registration is currently open. Um, and later in September, we will have one on maternal mor uh, mortality and morbidity and that registration will be forthcoming. Uh, so that's all you'll hear from for me for now. So right now I'd like to hand it off to my um, AHA colleague, Marie Cleary Fishman, uh, who's the Vice President of Clinical Quality here at the AHA. Jen, thank you so much. I really am glad to be here today. Appreciate it. Um, I will apologize up front for not being on video with everyone today. Um, I am on the road and uh, where I'm at right now is just uh, not conducive to, to being on camera. So uh, I appreciate your um, forgiveness for that as we start. So um, I am Marie Clary Fishman. I'm the Vice President for Clinical Quality, as Jen mentioned, at the American Hospital Association and responsible for working with the team on age-friendly health systems for the AHA. And so this is an area that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, and I really love this work and I'm very excited when I get to speak about it. Um, I am a nurse by birth at this point um, and have a lot of healthcare experience. I'm also married to a physician, so I can, can't get away from healthcare in my life, and uh, that's fine with me. So, next slide, Jen. So, today's agenda we're going to, we did welcomes and introductions with Jen. We're going to talk a little bit about the age friendly health systems and the value that it brings to you in healthcare and also to our. Uh, public around us and that are in the communities in which we work. We'll do an overview of the action community 
And then we are um, lucky to have our folks from Duke Regional Hospital here to talk to us a little, little bit about the implementation of age-friendly health systems. And then we have time for some questions and answers. Next slide. So let me start out by asking this question. When you hear the term age-friendly, what does it mean to you? It has so many different meanings to so many different people. Um, if we're able to use the chat right now, I'd love to ask you to chat in what you think age-friendly means and how you uh, think about it in your world. So please go ahead and, and chat that in. Next slide. Hey, Marie and everyone. Um, I'm getting notes from my from my colleagues is that our chat is actually disabled um, okay. and I'm unable to go in and edit it. It must have been a fun Zoom update that we were unaware of. So apologies that that feature is not working. And so a workaround, especially for questions, is please email us at team training at aha.org uh, for any questions you might have technically logistically or for our speakers um, and we will handle questions that way i believe people can see our chats it's just disabled for participants so again apologies for that uh blunder on our end so thank you jen i appreciate that so instead if you would take a few minutes just while you're listening to my what matters story to write down what you think age-friendly means to you, because it really is important for us to sort of have our own personal grounding of what age-friendly means. And so please do that while I'm telling you my age-friendly story. As I mentioned before, um, I have been leading age-friendly pretty much until uh, since the beginning, which was um, around, I think, 2017. And I didn't realize, but at the same time, I was starting my own age-friendly journey. I just didn't know what I was calling it at the time. I mentioned that I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse, as you can see. Oh, there's that picture that my staff was looking for. Um, you can see that I started as a candy striper way, way, way back. And um, I have a small family. There's just four of us. I have one brother, and uh, he now has two kids, my sister-in-law, Sue. So we're a very small, tight-knit family. We are animal lovers, as you might see, although even my pet family has shrunk down a little bit uh, since, since this picture. Uh, and I have my niece and nephew, which are, of course are very um, important to me and uh, a real key part of my life. My mom and dad are old country Irish. My dad was born in, uh, both born in Ireland. My dad's an old country farmer. You can see the picture of him there. Cutting the lawn is something very important to him. And uh, that's my nephew there on the riding tractor. And that's all my, also my nephew now who is six foot four uh, redhead. My mom went on her own age-friendly journey. Um, she suffered from Alzheimer's disease for about 10, 11 years. She passed away in 2017. And my dad was her full-time caregiver, uh, even in um, 2014 when he had to have uh, minimally invasive bypass surgery was supposed to be no big deal. Um, Post-recovery, he had a full-blown cardiac arrest back to the OR, his chest cracked. And the surgeon came out to us and said that he wasn't going to survive. And, and my husband's a cardiologist, so as you could imagine, um, he was there with us and uh, he said to the surgeon, give us another hour. He said, just give him, give him a chance to settle. And the surgeon kind of uh, humored him, I think, because they were friends and he did, he went back and he came back less than an hour later. And he said, I don't know what to tell you, but he's, he's stable. We were able to close his chest. We're able to bring him back out. I don't know what's gonna happen, but my dad recovered. Uh, and we are currently living with my father today. When my mom passed away in 2017, my dad was all alone and um, my husband and I were thinking about selling our house. And I said to my husband, what do you think about moving in with my dad? And he said, well, you know, check with your father. What does he think? And uh, so we asked my dad if he wanted us to move in and he said, yes. He said nothing would make him happier. And so we are on this age-friendly journey together um, and have been since we moved in with my father. And it is a constant negotiation about what matters to each of us, um, and including the dog and the cat. There's only one left, my yellow tabby and uh, my Sheltie on the right. But you can see in the picture here of a Chicago winter, and that's my dad in the front loader uh, vehicle plowing the snow. My dad will turn 91 in October. And so as you can imagine, 
what matters most to him is that he doesn't ever end up in a wheelchair unable to motivate and move around for himself. So everything we do and every conversation I have with my dad is around reminding him and honoring the fact that he wants to be able to be mobile and he wants to be able to move. My dad is mentally as sharp as he possibly could be, sharper I think some days than I am, um, but he does have medications that he's on and we are always mindful about that. He loves nothing more than to watch my niece, who's uh, now 18 and going to uh, Missouri State. She's going to be playing volleyball for Missouri State. He loves nothing better than watching her play volleyball. Um, she was down there in a play playing a nurse. She's actually going to nursing school. So maybe that led to something. But my dad knows that if he wants to be able to climb the stadium stairs and be able to get to places where he can watch my niece play volleyball, he has to constantly work on his mobility. He is uh, conscious of that all the time. And we look at his medications and that focus on what matters is what keeps him alive every day, living the best life that he can. And we work together to do that for the three of us. Um, my husband is 77. And so he is also on his own journey. I'm 61. So we're all journeying to what age friendly means. And we do it together. And it's a blessing to be able to do that. So next slide. So why does the AHA want to do age friendly? Why is it important to us as an organization? We have a strategic plan for 2022 to 2024, and we have pillars that are what is important to the field, what's important to the members. And then we have threads, and these threads will be part of every strategic pillar that we work on within the organization. And so if you look at this, and as you learn more about age friendly, you can see that better care and greater value is a pillar and something that Age Friendly clearly supports. And then the other pillar that we've really been working on is public trust and confidence. Knowing that your healthcare or health system is age friendly really helps build that public trust and confidence in your community. And then workforce, we've also seen that establishing age friendly health care and health systems um, really helps your workforce be, feel better about the care they're giving because what matters is important to all of those that provide care as well in healthcare besides just receiving it. Our approach at the AHA, we use this circle and I think it's a really great way to think about this. So whatever the issue is in the center of this wheel, so age-friendly health systems, we look at all the, lens, the lenses that are around that. So what are the public policy issues around age-friendly? What can we do to be innovative and what Field engagement is what is the view of the members? What do the members need as they go forward? And then what we come up with are products that are around advocacy, thought leadership, knowledge exchange, being an agent of change that all leads to best in class operations. And so everything we do at the AHA goes through this model, age friendly included. Next slide. So I have to thank the John A. Hartford Foundation. They are the most amazing. Um, philanthropic organization to work with. They're out of New York. They've been, were established uh, by the family who owns the a &P grocery stores, which I grew up on in Chicago here since 1929. And they are dedicated to improving the care of older adults. They have three priority areas. One, which is age-friendly health systems, family caregiving, and serious illness and end-of-life care. And you can see how those three things in, overlap, <coughs> excuse me, and work together in a way that the John A. Hartford Foundation is able to bring help to the community and bring resources to those of us who need to look at how we care for those who are aging in our own communities. And uh, I think Amy Berman, Dr. Amy Berman is on our call today and um, she is our project lead on this and we are ever so grateful. Uh, Amy is also a nurse and she is just an amazing partner to work on bringing age friendly to our health systems. Next slide. So why age-friendly health system? Why do we want to do this? Why do we need to do this in, 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 uh, today when we have so many things on our plate as healthcare systems and so many things to deal with? If we just look at the demography, the, the, number, of a, um, the number of older adults in our nation, is, it's growing dramatically. Um, we are projected to outnumber the number of children by the year 2035. So when you look at those numbers, it is just obvious that the case for 
working and focusing on older adults is just imperative as we go forward. And it's also international. We have also worked with some international folks in Australia, Ireland, um, I think uh, South Korea, I think has been another one. Um, we've had just great international connections as well. In addition to more older adults, those 65 and older, the complexity of those individuals is so much greater than those that are younger. 80% of those 65 and older have one chronic condition, 77% have two chronic conditions, 75% will require some long-term care, and 40% will require care in a skilled nursing facility. So if you look at that complexity, even more reasons to do that. And then finally, added on to that, is that this population is at risk in, just, in a disproportionate way for harm. And you can see the numbers go up there and also um, the demographics uh, by um, ethnic background as well. So working in age friendly for all of those reasons gives us an almost indisputable reason for making sure that our care is age friendly. Next slide. So what's our goal? This is not just a project. It's not just a program, <laughs> excuse me. It's a social movement that we wanna see spread across the nation so that all the care that we give to older adults is age friendly. And that means it's evidence-based practices guided by the four Ms, what matters, mentation, mobility, and medication. It doesn't cause harm. And again, consistent with that, what matters to the older adult and their caregiver family around them. We have some very specific aims uh, that we have actually reached and exceeded. We have more than a thousand hospitals and practices recognized as ad age friendly. And then by 6-30-23, we wanna reach older adults in over 2,500 hospitals and practices and 100 post-acute care communities. So we really want to engage with you to help you be successful <clears throat> and to build age-friendly communities across our nation and internationally where we can. I always say to people as I travel and as I go different places, I wanna make sure that I can find age-friendly health systems wherever I go. So if I need care, um, I'm gonna show up at your doorstep and look for age friendly. So clearly we are here to help. We're gonna talk more about what it means to be age friendly today. And I thank you all for participating in this and it's this really important work. Next slide. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm like uh, our president the other day was coughing like crazy. Um, I mentioned, I, I talked a little bit about this already. So I think, um, I just wanna say that there was a, a, at least a year spent on creating the evidence for this. So this is really strongly evidence-based and it actually simplifies and reduces the work sometimes around making sure you're doing all these things because it aligns it all around the what matters. And that is so important, not only to our patients and their families, but to our caregivers. We've heard a lot lately about the burden and the work, the burnout and the, and the burden that workforce has had. And if we go back to thinking about what matters with the workforce as well, it makes the work so much more meaningful. And so age-friendly health systems helps do that for our workforce in addition. And these things are really synergistic and they work together. If you only look at medication, that without looking at what matters, you may be giving someone medication that doesn't help them meet their life goals. And so making sure you're looking at these four things together really helps fine tune the care for a particular patient or the way they live their life and really gets to that age friendly uh, philosophy. Next slide. Okay, um, that's it for me right now. And I am going to turn this over to Manishwar Singh, who's my colleague at AHA. And he's gonna give you an overview of the action communities and how it really works to get involved in this social movement. Thank you. You're on mute. Just... Oh, thank you so much. I thought I unmuted. Thanks, Marie. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak on Age Friendly, so I'm glad you were able to join us today. And I'm the Nashwar Singh, a performance improvement coach with the AHA, and I also work on this Age Friendly Health Systems movement that's 
to, and for our action communities. So uh, Jen, next slide, please. So what are age-friendly action communities? Well, it starts in 2017, there were five US health system pioneers and they partnered with the Age-Friendly Health Systems Initiative to test the 4Ms framework, refine and scale up the Age-Friendly Health Systems framework in hospital and ambulatory care settings. We have short case studies on them where you can read about this on AHA, www.aha.org slash agefriendly. And you can learn how they've successfully implemented the four M's in their organizations, leading to reductions in patient lengths of stay and readmissions, improvement in patient and family engagement, as well as patient satisfaction, and also having a positive return on investments and improvement in patient safety. So the action community is a seven month long, mostly virtual learning community that's working towards reliably implementing the four M's uh, care in your own local settings. So the action community provides an opportunity to implement and test these resources in your care settings. Um, this will be the fourth action community the AHA will be hosting. And in the past, we've had anywhere from 135 to 180 plus teams to, to participate. And we've even had international teams from Australia, South Korea, and Ireland participate as well throughout these action communities. So multiple sites of care within a hospital or health systems can enroll in the action community at the same time. There's no cost to participate. The only cost includes the time that the team must allocate to engage in the seven month long uh, action community activities, uh, which we'll go over in the next slide as well. Uh, that includes webinars, calls, data collections, measurements, and testing the specific changes in their daily work, um, and just reporting in, in between on the progress in between calls. The action community testing and learning is designed to occur as a part of each person's existing activities and is therefore a repurposing of time rather than incrementally adding additional time. For example, a hospital or practice will generate and review quality reports as a part of their standard work, but as a part of the action community, certain quality indicators may be segmented by age, for example. Next slide, please. So here you can see some of the types of activities that are available to a site who enrolls uh, in the action community. So these calls include monthly calls uh, to review content focused on the four M's. Teams will have the opportunities to highlight their progress and learnings with others on these calls. We do have two types of calls. Uh, there will be team calls, which are focused on the four M's content, and then also topical calls based off of uh, specific topics that we want to cover that seem relevant to our current action community or certain uh, you know, hot topics that we always do, such as uh, EMRs and health systems. Um, so you know, Epic and Cerner are big ones, so we definitely have a specific webinar for how to implement the four Ms and integrate your EMR experience into this as well. Um, we'll be testing changes with the interventions. Um, there are one, uh, there's one in-person or virtual meeting, depending on the circumstances in February, where we have uh, convening to get together to discuss all the work that's been done um, and celebrate our successes. Um, some of the work also includes electronic monthly data submissions to IHI. IHI's analysis will help participants identify opportunities for improvements. Um, and there's also a leadership track hosted by IHI to support system level scale up. So we can also provide you information on that. Next slide, please. So on this slide, you'll see an overview of the action community schedule and activities. Each, uh, each month, there'll be two calls. Like I said, the one team call and one web or one topical call. And we assume that all teams are coming into action communities having some of the four M's in practice already at, at some point in time. And we aim to support teams to reliably implement the four M's throughout this entire process. Before the start of our action communities, those enrolled will need to identify a team that will, des that will be designated to operationalize the four M's in their care setting and a leader slash sponsor who will uh, work on the spread and scale of the four M's. Multiple sites of care within the hospital team can enroll. And this action community starts in September of this year. So uh, we'll have two kickoff calls in September. Um, and then we'll start our, you know, our content for the rest of the months. 
So we start in October and we go all the way through to April. And you can see we have an in-person meeting uh, tentatively scheduled for February this year or next year, sorry. Um, and yeah, so this is uh, a seven month long schedule. So you can see this is kind of the time commitment that um, you'll be looking at. Next slide, please. So this shows uh, some of the work that happens in between these webinars. So you'll come to the webinar, you'll uh, get the content and we'll have subject matter experts also available. We'll have peer to peer sharing on these webinars. And in between these, um, we suggest implementing a PDSA format to implement your test of change and then scale up from there. So um, we suggest the PDSA format, but you can use any mechanism or modify this format uh, to, to learn your way from going into developing your definition of the four M's and implementing your interventions. For example, your definition could be screening for delirium every 12 year or 12 months when an older adult is in the hospital. But we don't tell you what to do and what tools to use, but we'll definitely provide um, one of the topical calls that we're looking at. We'll provide a lot of these performance improvement tools uh, that you can look at that you'll be able to implement to help implement the four M's into your practice. Next slide, please. In the action community, you'll have access to multiple resources and guides to help you on your work. You can visit IHI.org slash HFriendly to view all these resources. Um, and they, they have quite a bit available depending on uh, what type of site of care that you have, whether it's ambulatory or hospital or even a nursing home or home care. Um, or even a guide on how to make a business case to calculate ROI for age friendly if you need help to, to sell that to your team. Next slide, please. So your work in the action community will be recognized as you go and everything you do will contribute to you getting a nationally recognized um, as a participant of age friendly health systems or even committed to care excellence for older adults for age friendly health systems. So these are the two levels. What you have to do to get the level one is complete your definition of care. Uh, and basically that's a submission to the IHI. And that outlines kind of like your action plan of what you aim to do and what you hope to implement uh, as a part of this age-friendly journey. And then once you have that um, approved by the IHI, you can start to submit counts. So you'll create your uh, care definition uh, basically your action plan, submit that to IHI, and then once that all gets approved, um, you start to implement it and you'll count uh, the number of people 65 and up who, uh, who you touched, basically uh, older adult patients, and by submitting those counts, after three months, um, you'll be recognized with the Committed to Care Excellence for Older Adults. So next slide, please. So Marie had mentioned that uh, some of our goals early on uh, spread to spread this age-friendly movement to a thousand sites by the end of 2020, and that was definitely surpassed earlier than we thought. Um, goal number two was to spread to 2,600 sites by June 2023, and you can see we've had a great success uh, with this age-friendly movement. Currently, we have 2,837 hospitals, practices and uh, convenient care clinics, nursing homes, all within the 50 states uh, that have joined uh, the movement. So this is great progress to see, and we love to see it grow even more. Uh, you can see that we have almost 800 sites recognized to date uh, for committed to care excellence throughout the, uh, throughout the USA. Next slide, please. And I did want to take a quick moment to go over some testimonials uh, from teams that have participated in prior action communities. Uh, I won't read through all of them, but I'll give us some of the gist. So we've heard from teams who have experienced uh, the benefits of having what matters conversations with patients. Um, another team shared uh, advice to prospective teams such as yourselves, and you're probably using this type of framework already but the forums uh, in the action community provides more guidance on daily care of older adults in a simple and organized manner. Uh, one team wanted to highlight the importance of getting excited about this work and taking the time to celebrate. Um, and we're also here to support you in this journey. 
Um, one team appreciated all of that support. We also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching calls uh, throughout the action community as well. So uh, if you want, you can also uh, notify us at our, at our email. We can help set up a coaching call and I'm one of the coaches that uh, you'll be working with. So we can look at your specific situation, bring a subject matter expert on one of the four M's and uh, definitely help you brainstorm an intervention or work through whatever issue you might be having. And finally, this is an amazing opportunity to help the older adult community, which is the basics of why we're all here today. Next slide, please. We've heard it from a lot of people. Uh, what's the value in becoming an age-friendly health, health system? And what's the value of this work? Um, when patients receive care in an age-friendly health system, it improves value not only for the patients, but for the families, the caregivers, the healthcare providers, and the overall healthcare system um, through uh, the AHA's value initiative. And the AHA is addressing affordability through the lens uh, of value to improve outcomes and enhance the patient experience while reducing the cost. So as you implement uh, these age-friendly measures, you'll see a lot of your quality measures uh, will also improve. Um, so it's very important uh, to see that, you know, age-friendly care is great quality care. Um, so it all kind of should align with what we're already uh, hoping to aim with our care. Next slide, please. And here's some case examples of organizations that the AHA has collaborated with through site visits and one-on-one -on -one calls. And, and they've seen uh, quite an improvement in their patient outcomes. Uh, St. James Parish is a rural critical access hospital and started implementing this work in their inpatient unit. And in the first nine months of their implementation, the hospital reduced readmissions by 62% and had a cost savings of $93,000. Um, and in the fall of 2020, the hospital began to introduce age friendly to new employees and just made it a part of their new hire orientation for residents and nursing staff. Advent Health in Hendersonville uh, is using telehealth to streamline the age-friendly annual wellness visits, which has led to 20% increase in uh, breast cancer and colon cancer screenings. So they've also hired two geriatric psychiatrists and a licensed social worker to the uh, age-friendly team, which has led to greater completion in fall risk assessments as well. Cedar sinai Medical Center, uh, their geriatric fracture program embodies a 4M framework to minimize the potential complications for geriatric inpatients. And in their first year, the program has uh, served 153 older adults and reduced the length of stay by 11% and yielded $333,000 direct cost savings. Moving forward, the program projects to save a uh, million dollars as it expands to serve 300 patients annually. Next slide, please. So given all this information, uh, we'd like to invite you to join the AHA's action community um, in the 2022 to 2023 uh, segment starting this September. Um, we've had more than 400 sites of care join in our past uh, action communities combined, and you can definitely join too. Um, so you can enroll today. I'm not sure if you can click the link, but all the links and uh, the, the PDFs for this uh, webinar will be provided afterwards where you can click through the links and go through the information. Uh, but just as a recap, this starts mid-September with two kickoff calls and our team and topical calls start in October. And just as a reminder, we also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching calls throughout this entire process. And yeah, definitely check out our invitation guide to join us. Um, you can download that there or at aha.org slash agefriendly. And if you have any questions specific to AHA-Friendly, you can email ahaactioncommunity at aha.org with any questions. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to our guest speakers, um, Nikki Webb, Serena Wong, and Lori Ritter. Hi there, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Serena Wong. I am a geriatrician at Duke and I'm just gonna get my slides pulled up here. Get rid of this. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Awesome. Um, yes, thanks for having us. Uh, we are from the Duke Health System, Health System where we have started working on the age-friendly journey at Duke Regional Hospital. 
and I'm joined today by Lori Ritter, who is our geriatric clinical nurse specialist, and Nikki Webb, who is um, a licensed social worker by training, formerly a uh, case manager at Duke Regional Hospital, and currently our geriatrics program director. So first, I want to start by kind of explaining why, why did we choose Duke Regional Hospital um, as our site to start working on age-friendly. Um, Duke Health includes Duke University Hospital, a large academic tertiary care center, Duke Raleigh Hospital, which is a smaller regional hospital focused more on surgical care, and our site, Duke uh, Regional Hospital, or DRH. So DRH is a 388-bed community hospital. It's located about 15 minutes north of Duke University Hospital, and we have medical and surgical specialties, a behavioral health unit, and we are a stroke center. Um, Duke Health also includes multiple primary care and subspecialty clinics, as well as a population health management office. And we have multiple interprofessional health learners, including from the medical, uh, PA, nursing, PT, and OT programs. Um, all, all of these learners rotate at Duke Regional Hospital. Um, we also have visiting pharmacy students from other North Carolina colleges. So we're located in North Carolina, in Durham, um, which has a growing population of just under 300,000 residents. We're in the Research Triangle of North Carolina, and Duke Regional especially prides itself on caring for members of the local community. So why DRH? Um, over the years, we've established Duke Regional Hospital as our health systems geriatrics hub. Um, we have an optimizing care for older adults think tank. This is an interprofessional group started in 2016, where people from the healthcare, where, where healthcare team members from all different professions, as well as representatives from the patient and family council meet to discuss ways to improve care for older adults at Duke, Duke Regional. So this group um, was already established. It provided a great core of interested and dedicated people from whom we draw our age-friendly steering committee. We also have programs to provide geriatric specific education for nurses and nursing aides. Although, although these GRNs and GCAs are located throughout our health system. We also have achieved bronze level geriatric emergency department accreditation and are working on more geriatrics focused quality improvement projects in our emergency department. We have an inpatient geriatrics consultation service and we also have a dedicated geriatric clinical nurse specialist to lead geriatrics focused educational and quality programs with our nurses. Um, and because Duke Regional is a smaller hospital with a community focus, um, it has proved to be a fertile area to pilot programs to improve the care of older adults. So when leadership and administration at the health system level learned about the age-friendly health systems initiative, they were interested in bringing it to Duke, and it seemed that DRH was the natural choice to build our team and develop our programs and eventually scale up to the other Duke sites. So when we started thinking about the four Ms, we had the benefit of piggybacking after two system-wide inpatient care redesign programs that had been completed in the year prior to the beginning of our age-friendly journey. The mobility care redesign program incorporated teaching all inpatient nurses how to screen for mobility limitations using the BMAT, um, the bedside mobility assessment tool. The BMAT score informs the nurse each shift on the patient's safe mobility level and provides guidance on what equipment and mobility exercises that nursing staff can and should engage the patient with. So during this care redesign program, our nurses were instructed to assess the BMAT score once each 12 hour shift and to mobilize the patient once per shift according to their BMAT level. The delirium care redesign program also done before Age Friendly Journey started. Um, this incorporated teaching all of our inpatient nurses how to screen for delirium using the nursing delirium screening scale or new desk. 
The new desk score is assessed once per 12 hour shift and its measurement automatically updates a delirium banner in the patient chart. So the banner alerts team members that a patient is at risk for delirium, has screened positive for delirium or is persistently positive for delirium and provides interventions to assess and treat delirium. So for our medications and what matters most programs, we were basically starting from scratch. Uh, for medications, our system is plagued with many of the issues that affect all of the other health systems in the country, including electronic systems that don't communicate, patients who receive medications from multiple, multiple sources, and a lot of alerts that trigger when providers order medications that they may or may not pay attention to or override. One existing project that's still in development that helped us was an automated geriatric summary page that identified high-risk medications automatically. So any active or recent high-risk medication order for that patient is displayed in a list on their summary page within their chart. So this is a new program, um, and we haven't yet been able to get this widely adopted for use among our providers. For what matters most, our pal palliative care division has been leading an effort to better document and track goals of care conversations in the chart. So they had already made some progress in improving the ease of finding this documentation. Um, however, we in the geriatrics world, in, a, in the age friendly, we believe that what matters most incorporates not only what a person's wishes are at the end of life or in times of distress, but really should be assessed in terms of their goals and priorities um, in their daily activities and function. So we had some work to do in terms of how to ask these questions, who should ask these questions, how to track each patient's goals, um, making sure that we are considering their goals in our care decisions, um, and also combating some of the pre-existing notions of, um, of the fact or the idea that what matters most equals end of life preferences. So this is our timeline. Um, in our first year of working on Age Friendly, we focused on team building. We assembled a leadership committee consisting of myself and Dr. Milta Little, both of us are geriatricians, um, Nikki Webb, a clinical social worker uh, who's joining me on the call. And she serves as our geriatric division program manager. And Lori Ritter also on this call, who's our geriatrics clinical nurse specialist at Duke Regional. Um, to support this committee, we, um, we recruited an interprofessional team that we dubbed our steering committee. Many of our steering committee members came from our optimizing care for older adults committee. And we met with stakeholders, including nurses, physicians, patient and family advisory council members um, to obtain buy-in. Our steering committee members developed processes to pilot for each of the M's, which I'll go into in more detail on later slides. So as you can imagine, seeing those dates on our timeline, the first year was tough. Um, we spent a, oops, sorry. We spent a lot of time um, and effort discussing what age-friendly means and why it's important um, because there are obviously or very important competing needs for our resources. So a few months into our process, we actually had to um, shift gears. The original nursing unit that we were engaging with fell through, um, but we approached a different unit and luckily we're able to get um, some buy-in and switch units. So our second phase consisted of small PDSA cycles of change, um, wherein we engaged small groups of four to six patients at a time in the program, and we tested our processes for each M. We had monthly steering committee meetings, and we reviewed each pilot patient's case um, in great detail to see what worked and what didn't work. By the time we reached December of 21, we felt that our processes um, for, for what we were doing, we're working and we wanted to scale up to all patients age 65 and older on our unit. However, the Delta variant hit and so we were delayed by several months. So we're currently in our third phase of rollout where we're capturing data on all of the patients on that unit age 65 and older on our processes that we've worked on so far. 
Um, so throughout this whole time, we've been working hard with a data analyst to build a dashboard to measure our outcomes so we don't need to review and document each case manually. So now that you kind of have an idea of what we've been working on the past two years, I'll go into more of the details of what we've done so far. Um, this is our steering committee, our leadership structure at the top. Um, as you can see, we worked to make sure that each of our um, committee or little subcommittees was interprofessional so that we could think broadly about each of the topics. And then our folks at the bottom here are really important groups of people who span all the four Ms, our nursing leaders, patient and family advisory council members, um, working with the redesign leadership for delirium and mobility, and then folks in our division of palliative care. I'm not gonna go too much into too much detail on this, but this is the process that we did for each of our four Ms, um, from delirium, um, screening and assessing risk factors, care plan implementation to manage delirium when it's positive, for mobility, aiming to mobilize patients once per shift according to um, the mobility care redesign program. For medications, our occupational therapists were engaged in screening patients for whether they need assistance with managing their meds at home. And we worked on a process to review um, medications with our pharmacists and providers. And then for what matters most, we uh, engage with several different uh, members of um, our different in interprofessional groups to ask what matters most and, um, and tailor their therapies according to what mattered to the patients. So here is some of our work so far. Um, we are still an age-friendly participant, so we're still working on our M's. I'm going to hand it off to Nikki or uh, to Lori to talk about mentation. Hi, everyone. So um, like Dr. Wong said, I'm Lori Ritter. I'm a geriatric clinical nurse specialist here at DRH. Um, so in our initial PDSA cycles on chart review, we found that we did have a high compliance of delirium screening with the new deaths, as well as care plan implementation for our delirious patients um, or for those patients who are at high risk for delirium. Um, right now, we are developing our performance dashboard to accurately capture this data automatically so we don't need to do those um, chart reviews. So then we began to think about what other actions could we have? Like Dr. Wong already mentioned, the delirium banner was implemented during the delirium care redesign, but was initially only visible to our nurses and providers. Um, we thought it should be seen by the entire interdisciplinary team members, such as PT, OT, speech, uh, case managers and pastoral care. So um, we made that happen with our EPIC team. And um, after they could see it, I met with these teams to discuss their role in working with our patients with or at high risk for delirium. So we have very high engagement with all of our interdisciplinary teams. They're very excited to be um, part of this initiative. Um, next slide, please. So um, of course we have challenges and we are meeting those head on. Um, we wonder if we do have delirium rate improvement. And I can say based on my personal observations and from you know, daily chart reviews and my rounding on the units, um, I'd say yes. <laughs> but also I found on my kind of my rounds that I need to do a lot of just-in-time teaching with many of our newly hired RNs in the recognition of and the interventions for delirium. So it's an ongoing, um, you know, educational challenge. So in the last three months, we also decided to add to the, under the mentation umbrella, our dementia population um, on the inpatient side. So driving this decision includes the same issues we hear are happening in hospitals across the nation. Patients who are living with dementia end up with difficult behaviors that staff is not prepared or education to address confidently. So as Dr. Wong mentioned, 
We do offer a geriatric resource nurse program to our RNs and a geriatric care advocate class for our CNAs. And in these classes, they learn specific ways to work with our dementia population to proactively approach them to prevent the triggering of their fight and flight response, you know, which is already on high alert in this unfamiliar and many times high stress environment. Um, this is first steps. We have a lot of other things planned for future education for our nurses, and we really hope that this will make a difference in this population. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Yeah. Um, good. For mobility, uh, kind of just quickly running through this, we found that our nurses are evaluating for BMAT each shift, um, but and mobilizing patients once per shift, but we weren't really meeting the age-friendly requirements of three times a day. So uh, we suspect that our patients are mobilizing three times a day. So it's really capturing the documentation of our therapists and brainstorming other ways to be creative about this um, and working with the care redesign program um, to work on this mobility effort. Uh, for medications, we, um, we've kind of run into a lot of barriers. We couldn't really agree on who should be screening for high-risk medications, pharmacists, providers, the admitting provider, the discharging provider. Um, how are we doing this? We have a tool. Uh, we don't really know how to implement it yet. And then documenting that we've reviewed everything um, is another challenge. We worked hard to implement a screening program at our daily huddle on the unit, but for various reasons, including it was in the morning before pharmacy um, had really reviewed all the patients, um, and also that the existing goal of that huddle was for discharge disposition um, discussion. We, that ended up being something that we weren't able to overcome. So now we are working on, um, and we're on defining our action. Should we avoid high-risk meds? Should we de-prescribe high-risk home meds? Um, should we just use fewer high-risk meds? Um, how do we communicate with outpatient providers? We're still working on those questions. One thing we have developed is this kind of banner that identifies the antipsychotics, fears list meds, and antidepressants for each patient. So we have thought about mostly targeting these patients who show up as red um, as our, our first kind of go around to identify the most at-risk patients. We've also asked a hospitalist to join our work group um, to help us think about uh, this pro problem. Next, I'm gonna hand it to Nikki for what matters most. Thank you. So we anticipated our what matters workflow being a heavier lift. Um, so our approach to this work was in phases. We capitalized on the engagement of the interprofessional diversity of my work group, and we started by focusing on how everyone in the care team has a role to play um, in understanding and integrating what's important to patients within the scope of their practice for a more holistic and collaborative approach to patient-centered care. So our work group consisted of palliative care, medical director, therapists, case managers, a chaplain, and a member of the patient family advisory council, and we didn't want to duplicate the efforts of our palliative care team who were already engaging hospital medicine in capturing um, advanced care planning conversations. So we extended our approach beyond life, uh, um, end of life conversations, starting with our therapists and our case managers. Um, so this really was the beginning of a culture change where we became really intentional about asking open-ended questions for the purpose of engaging and encouraging patients to express their priorities and their desired outcomes within the scope of each team member's practice. So for example, physical therapists built into their assessment questions around what's important to the patients regarding mobility. And so this was really helpful in um, identifying actionable plans based on patients' preferences and concerns, which was integrated into the care plans, the treatment plans, and also into the discharge recommendations. Um, so we had great success with the therapists with buy-in because they embedded in their workflow across all units, not just our pilot unit, the practice of asking all patients of all ages what matters to them. But case management and therapy are consult services. So we knew that we weren't going to 
get to 100% of patients with this process. So um, we did get to about 70 to 80% of the patients in um, capturing what matters most conversations in their charts. Um, but to, next slide, um, get to 100% compliance, um, we really want to engage the hospital medicine providers in capturing into their notes what matters most to patients. But more importantly, we're really um, focusing on having nurses um, introduce for the 4Ms framework to patients and caregivers as they are being oriented in the admissions process to educate and advise patients and care, caregivers um, that the team will be asking what matters to them and that they, we really wanna know what's important to them to better inform practice and our, the care that they're receiving. Yeah. So that's our, that's our practice. Thanks, Nikki. Just kind of quickly wrapping up for us, our lessons learned to be actively engaged with stakeholders, um, balancing the competing priorities and making sure that we are putting in a lot of ongoing education and energy into what we're doing. Um, and we'll open up to questions and hand it back to Manishwar. Thank you all I'm for joining us. Uh, I'm actually, in the interest of time, I'm going to hand it over to Jen, but uh, thank you for uh, joining us, Serena, Nikki, and Lori. It's, it's always great to see the, the good work being done on this age-friendly work. Yeah, I really would like to thank all of our speakers today. Um, I know that the team wanted to point out some IHI case studies, which we'll share uh, via email following this, uh, this webinar by the end of the week. We also share the recording. Uh, I just wanna call out uh, that once we close out the webinar today, uh, you'll be prompted to complete an evaluation form. So please, please, please uh, take a moment to do that. We really value your feedback. Um, and then finally, uh, to claim your CE credit for today, uh, we'll have you text VANFEP to the number 919-213-8033. I also chatted that in uh, and we will share that uh, in the slides as well. So uh, thank you again today for joining us. And I'd like to uh, thank um, our speakers, uh, both from the AHA and, and Duke today. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day.